Hey, welcome back. I know you've been missing me. I've been missing you too. Let's talk logic. This one's going to be a little bit longer because it has to be. So sorry about that, but you can always pause it and come back to it. It's the beauty of technology. So quick review. Well, hopefully quick review. Philosophy, you know what the four branches are. You know what knowledge is, you know what the conception of wisdom we're working with is, you know what justification, truth, and belief are, you know that we're working with a correspondence theory of truth, all of that stuff, excellent. So onward and upward, we need to talk a little bit about arguments, which will supplement the reading a little bit, and it's going to be a little different, so you'll want to pay attention, and I know some of these concepts are on the folio. So let's go. Brief introduction to logic. We're going to go a little bit more depth than the chapter you read. Logic in general is the study and meth of methods and principles related to and distinguishing correct reasoning from incorrect reasoning. That's the most conventional kind of definition in the field of philosophy that I can give you. I'll talk a little bit more about what reason is in a minute, but it's basically saying, given the big, beautiful brains that we've got and the size of the brain isn't necessarily related to how smart we are, but we have a particularly interesting ability to see the relationships between certain ideas and know that some of those relationships work and other relationships do not. That's what logic's about, is establishing and using those relationships as criteria for judging arguments. The thing that, again, I want to reinforce, I've said before, I'll keep saying it, because hopefully that'll help make it stick. Logic is a normative endeavor. It is telling us, here's the way people should think, as opposed to, this is the way people do think. People make lots of mistakes. We have, we're going to have criteria to sh say that they're making a mistake, and the thinking they are exhibiting and the beliefs they have are wrong. We're not going to be judging people. We're not saying people are stupid or idiots or anything else. But what we are saying is that argument is necessarily bad, so no one should believe it. And if someone continues to believe it, that's okay. That's their choice. But they're believing something false. They're believing something wrong. So that's about what I want you to take away, knowing that it's telling us how we should think. And it's giving us criteria once we establish a handful of basic kind of criteria, criterion, uh, it'll be objective and applied to everybody. And where are those criteria going to come from? They're going to come from reason. Reason in philosophy is different than the way people use that term outside of philosophy, like a whole bunch of other stuff that we've been talking about. Reason is specifically the faculty, faculty in terms of ability, right? Another word for kind of an ability we have. The ability we have to determine the truth or falsehood of a proposition, claim, whatever you want to call it, without appealing to empirical evidence. So there are certain relationships between ideas that we can know that certain statements about those relationships are true or false just by thinking about it without looking to empirical evidence, without looking to the external world, just by thinking about it. That'll be a little tricky for some people, but I'll explain it more in a minute. Propositional logic is kind of the closest we're going to get to do anything formal. Propositional logic is just logic that applies to propositions. There's a gazillion sorts of logic out there. Mathematic, math lot, like mathematical logic will also be symbolic, symbolic logic. Formal logic will both use mathematical and symbolic logic. You have computer logics out there. You have a gazillion different types of logic in the world but we're focusing on propositional logic. All of those logics, by the way, are founded on the same principles and ideas, the same basic assumptions. So they don't, different logics don't di produce different answers. They just do it in slightly different ways, um, at least the sorts of logic we're gonna study. So there aren't different logics that give different answers. They just do it in a slightly different way. Think of it as if you were doing a math problem in your head versus writing it out each step still going to get the same answer and the same answer will be right, but it happens in a slightly different way. Propositions, and I've been talking about it, and I'm going to use proposition, claim, idea, 
because I'm not going to be too much of a stickler about the words at this point. Um, but propositions are declarative statements with a truth value. What does that mean? It means that they are statements that describe something in the world that can be determined to be true or false. So a statement like a triangle has three sides. I'm declaring something about the universe or world, whether it's physical world or the world of ideas. Triangles, that concept of triangle includes that it has three sides. And I could make more specific three and only three sides. That's me declaring something. As we talked about before with regard to truth, that statement we'll say is true because if I hold up the statement, triangles have three and only three sides. And then I look to the world and I say, okay, what's the definition of a triangle? Three-sided figure. Sweet. That's true. Declarative statement about the world that might be false would be, getting back, uh, there are... 17 tumblers on Chad's table. There aren't. There's only one. So we would hold that statement up to the physical world and say, ooh, that's not right. Or I could say a triangle has 15 sides. That would be false, right? Triangles do not have 15 sides. By definition, a triangle is a three and only three-sided figure. So that's what a proposition is. Declarative statements with a truth value. And the truth value, again, is the property of the claim, is the property of the proposition. It's not a proposition. There aren't true tumblers and true tri triangles in the world. There are statements about tumblers and triangles that are true. So when someone's saying, oh, they're a true friend, they're just using you know, kind of as a metaphor analogy, like they're actually a good friend. Um, so truth is a property of propositions. Propositions are claims about the world that have a truth value. That doesn't mean we know the truth value. Back to God exists is a proposition. That I don't have adequate justification to ever know whether or not it's true or not doesn't mean the statement's not truth evaluable, meaning it has a truth value. So just a little reminder of that distinction between truth and justification that's going to be super important for a lot of people. Arguments, what we really want to get to and what I've been talking about is they're kind of the building blocks. They're the currency. They're what we're thinking about when we do any sort of philosophy in the tradition that I'm teaching from, that kind of analytic Western tradition. We're looking at arguments using logic. Arguments are collections of proposition which contain at least one premise and at least one conclusion. Now, what are premises and conclusions? That's an important question. Premises and conclusions are the sole and only required building blocks of arguments. Premises being those propositions that offer support or reasons or grounds or evidence for accepting another proposition. Anything that's being used as a reason or evidence that's being expressed, I no, there is a tumbler on the table. That's my conclusion. Because I can see it. It's defined as a tumbler. I've asked you all whether or not it's defined as a tumbler. That's, those are all our reasons. Those are all premises to the argument of, therefore, we're going to say there's a tumbler on the table. Arguments like those presented in the chapter. All men are mortal. Premise. Socrates is a man. Premise. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Conclusion. That's what we're looking for in arguments is try, first and foremost, we almost always want to identify what are the premises or what is the one premise and what's the conclusion. That's what we're talking about. And we demand good ones. Just that something is set up in the format that it has premises and a conclusion doesn't make it any good. Because going back to what we were talking about, it's normative. We're going to say some arguments are horrible and no one should believe them and no one should accept their conclusion. And other arguments, we're going to say, oh yeah, based on that argument, we can accept that conclusion. Another thing to remember, I'm going to plant a seed about right now. Just because a specific argument does not support its conclusion doesn't mean the conclusion's false. It just means we aren't going to accept it based on those reasons alone, right? Today is Wednesday. There's a tumbler on my desk. Therefore, my name is Chad. 
The conclusion's true, but those reasons aren't enough to get me to the conclusion. So you'd say that's a terrible argument because those premises don't get me to the conclusion. Conclusion, a proposition that is presumably being supported, established based upon one or more of the premises. So in it, using logic, using philosophy, our conclusion has to come from the premises provided, period. For now, just say period. Don't think about implicit premises or don't think about, well, we all just assume that's true. We're gonna risk, lay out everything. Everything that's required to prove the conclusion we have to have or the argument doesn't work. Types of arguments. Two types that I want to focus on just because uh, a lot of people hear these words and I've used these words, but we're going to use them in very specific ways. And it's not super important. I just want to distinguish because a lot of times people get caught up in trying to prove things with certainty and that's not always possible. So we're going to talk about deductive arguments, which are those arguments which attempt to prove with certainty their conclusion. So a deductive argument form would be all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? There's no way possible if those first two premises are true for Socrates to be immortal. It's not possible. If it is the case that each and every person on the planet, right, is mortal, every human, male human, is mortal and Socrates is one of those, then it absolutely positively has to be the case that he is mortal, period. There's no argument because unless you're gonna deny one of those two initial premises. So that would be a deductive argument form, an argument that's trying to prove its conclusion with certainty. Inductive arguments lead to the probability of their conclusion. You want a great example for these that you see all the time? Think scientific evidence. Scientific arguments and research only ever yields inductive arguments. Science tells you that one thing's more probable than the other. It's why when you're reading the uh, results section of scientific papers, they almost never say there's a direct, necessary, causal connection between two things. They'll always say, given this number of observations, there's an exceedingly high probability of a co strong correlation between these two things or something like that because we can't get perfect certainty from the real world usually. There will be some exceptions, but I wanted to make sure people were that. That we can't get perfect certainty doesn't mean we don't know things because our criteria for justification about the external world or real stuff out there in the world will never be certainty. It just won't be that high. So that's just a quick aside. So. The last thing we need to talk about with regard to arguments that's super duper important is something that is mentioned in the reading, but I want to bring up again because it's super important. The distinction between validity and soundness. And we're going to use these terms differently than a lot of people use them in conventional language. They're both conventional definitions. This is how they're defined. This is how philosophers use them. Valid does not just mean good generally. Valid arguments are the formal property of the argument saying that it works, that the conclusion does follow from the premises. It basically says, hey, if your premises were true, your conclusion would either be absolutely positively true, if it's a deductive argument, or you've made your conclusion more probable than alternatives, if it's an inductive argument. So your premises guarantee your conclusion or make it more likely than other alternatives whether it's deductive or inductive, right? If my argument is all wikis are wonky, all of them, every single wiki in the world is wonky. You have a wiki, therefore you have something that's wonky. It's the same format as that Socrates argument, same form, same argument structure, right? You know that, you know there's no way. If it's true, if it's true that my premise is if it is true that all wikis are wonky and you have a wiki, then you know with absolute certainty every single time, no matter what, you have something wonky. That's just the relationship between those concepts, right? If A, then B, A, therefore B. That's a valid argument form. It's perfect. We love it. Because if the premises are true, then the conclusion follows. That's usually our first measure 
of an argument, the first thing we look at is, does the conclusion follow from the premises? And if it does, if, for example, like a really perfect argument form of the same form, all birds fly, chilly willy's a bird, therefore chilly willy flies. That is a perfect valid argument form. Now what we need to do is check out if it's sound, because we don't want to just talk about valid argument forms. We want arguments that tell us stuff about the world. And we can tell something about the world only if we talk about the truth of the premises. Truth meaning, do those premises map onto the world in a way such that they describe what's actually the case? Right back to our correspondence theory of truth. So let's look at our penguin argument for soundness. Right? Valid arguments, awesome. If the premises are true, the conclusion is true. We just discussed. My argument, all birds fly, chilly willy's a bird, therefore chilly willy flies, is a valid argument. It's valid. It's logically valid. The form's perfect. Is it sound? Well, do all birds fly? I don't know. Looks like every bird I can think of or I've seen flies. Chilly Willy is a bird. That's true. Chilly Willy is a bird. <gasps> but Chilly Willy, if you remember from the old timey cartoons with the little cute penguin with the red hat, he's a penguin. He can't fly. So my argument was valid, but it wasn't sound. So having a valid argument in and of itself isn't great, but it's the starting point. We need a sound argument, which is valid plus has true premises. And if it has true premises, we know it either has an absolutely certain true conclusion or a conclusion that's made spectacularly more likely than alternatives. So we are looking for valid arguments with true premises. True premises alone get us nothing, nothing at all. There's a great example in the chapter about that. I give examples all the time about it, right? Like. I have relatively small feet, I'm approximately average height, therefore my name is Chad. Those are all absolutely true statements. That's not an important or interesting argument because it's not valid. Because nothing about those premises gets you to the conclusion. So the truth of the premises only really matters if the argument's valid. An argument being valid is awesome, but then we have to worry about the truth of the premises. So I want you to start thinking in those terms. What are the relationships between these ideas? When I see people giving reasons for something, are they reasons that really lead me to the conclusion? Do they guarantee it? Are there alternative explanations? If someone says everything is one way or all things are one way, can I find one exception? Because how many penguins do I bring to the I have to bring to the table to make the statement, to demonstrate that the statement, all birds fly is false? just one. So keep all that stuff in mind as we move forward because this little tiny bit of logic is going to be super duper important to being able to analyze and evaluate both arguments for particular ethical theories and arguments applied to particular ethical issues and contemporary controversial issues. And that's what we're going to be spending most of the semester doing. Thank you for the time and your next video will have a little review of what does ethics really look like in a little more depth. Let me know if you have questions and I will see you next time.